All right, we are live on YouTube and here on Zoom. Welcome everybody to um, Delegate Back in this virtual town hall to discuss the COVID-19 pandemic and of course the vaccine rollout. We're um, uh, very happy that you could all join us this evening, especially our panel, whom Delegate Bagnall will introduce shortly. I just want to give you a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, please do keep yourself muted, uh, you know, throughout the meeting just to uh, help with, uh, uh, you know, the noise on the call. And also just to let you know, the call is being recorded and, uh, of course, broadcast live on YouTube. So just bear that in mind. Uh, also, the uh, the chat, of course, uh, is there. And if you have any questions, feel free to add, uh, write your questions, I should say, in the chat. And uh, we will try to get to as many of them as possible. Obviously, our, our panelists, their time is very tight and there may be many questions. So we will get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, but if we don't get to your question, um, then please feel free to uh, email the delegate and we'll put the uh, email address there in the chat also. And we will absolutely follow up with you. Uh, you know, in in a day or two. Uh, other than that, uh, it is of course my pleasure to welcome all of our panel and all of our guests. And uh, and at this time, I will hand over to Delegate back now. Thank you so much for joining us today for the third of our 2021 legislative session virtual town hall series. I'm Heather Bagnell, your delegate in District 33. I first want to thank you all for your continued commitment to staying safe by practicing physical distancing and safe protocols. We are now in week six of the 2021 session, continuing the work on our COVID relief packages to ensure we are supporting our Maryland working families to working on eviction protections, unemployment reform, and resiliency legislation for our schools and industries which were so adversely impacted by the pandemic. During this pandemic, our Anne Arundel County Public Schools Board of Ed and Superintendent have been actively collaborating with the county executive and other county superintendents across the state of Maryland to address the myriad challenges posed by the changing information coming from the CDC, the plans to transition to hybrid learning, and the metrics and plans to reopen school buildings. With the lack of a centralized appointment system across the county and the state, there has been a scramble to access vaccines. Local health departments have asked for more predictability and the General Assembly has continued to call upon the governor for more access, equity, transparency, and clarity. On social media, support groups such as Maryland Vaccine Hunters have sprung up to try and share information about vaccine scheduling, reflecting the early days of COVID when similar Facebook groups were created to offer guidance and support while navigating the new unemployment system. Here in Anne Arundel County, we have been wrestling with how to get vaccines in arms in an efficient and equitable manner with competing interests and inconsistencies between the state and county phases and the recommendations from the CDC. Suffice it to say, it's complicated. So I am incredibly honored to be joined tonight by an esteemed panel of, of experts Dr. Tony Geddon, the Deputy Health Officer for Anne Arundel County Health Department, Chief Tricia Wolford, the Fire Chief for Anne Arundel County Fire Department, Pamela Jordan, the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Anne Arundel County, and Delegate Jocelyn Pena Melnick, Delegate for District 21, Anne Arundel and Prince George's Counties, Vice Chair of the Health and Government Operations Committee, and member of the Joint COVID-19 Response Legislative Work Group. I also want to acknowledge Adam Spangler, who is here on behalf of Congressman Brown. As you can imagine, our panelists are very tightly scheduled, so we will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. But if we can't get to your question on the call, we will circle back with you to make sure you have answers. If you do have a question and have not submitted it in advance, please feel free to put your question in the chat. I also want to thank my team, Max Pierce and Luke Tudball, who are working hard behind the scenes to once again make me look far more tech savvy than I actually am. With that, I am honored to introduce my vice chair and powerhouse legislator, Delegate Jocelyn Pena Melnick. Jocelyn, Delegate Pena Melnick, thank you so much for being here tonight. I, I really appreciate you being here I, on a night when I know that you have, uh, you also have conflicting interests and, um, and uh, having your, your level of expertise on this call is, is really, really invaluable. Well, thank you for having me, um, Heather. You know, I, there's nothing that Heather does not ask of me that I do not comply. And this is because she works hard and she cares. She's diligent, she prepares, she does her homework and she's always there for her constituent. And I love that passion. 
Um, and I honestly, I see it and I recognize it. I mean, those that know me know that I get in trouble because I say things as I see them. Um, anyway, it's really a blessing to be here with all of you. I'm very honored. I am the vice chair of the Health and Government Operations Committee and the chair of the Public Health Committee for the House. So um, I, I'm, I want to discuss with you what we have been doing. So in the House, in the Senate, we have a work group and that work group has been meeting and we have been bringing um, the experts to come and address us. We know that COVID um, has hit the communities really hard, especially the communities of color, the black and brown communities. In Maryland, we have 23 counties in Baltimore City. I honestly love representing Anne Arundel and Prince George's and I represent them with the same passion and respect. Um, but the um, county with the highest number of COVID-19 cases in the entire state of Maryland is Prince George's County. Um, and that you know, tells us a lot because it's not only just having access to healthcare, um, it's also the social determinants of health. It is the way the communities of color, black and brown communities, you know, live in very crowded conditions. They can't social distance. Many of them are actually essential workers. The lack of transportation, not making enough, enough money, you know, um, not having the education. So we as a legislature, as Heather just stated, Delegate Bagno, we are focusing on bringing relief to our communities, which is why we passed the Relief Act. Um, and we're working on helping people with their rent and helping people, we you know, in finding food and health care. Um, so we have been putting a lot of pressure on the governor's office because he decided basically not to have a centralized system and allowed basically all 24 jurisdictions to have their own program. And there are 24 health officers in Maryland for the 24 counties, 6 million people in Maryland. And rather than do it all, you know, from his office, have one way to do it, one system, one registration system, right? Let's be in the same face, which is one C for the state. Every state government, right? Every local government is doing it differently. So some are in face 1A, 1B, 1C, and it's a little bit chaotic because people can find an appointment. So it's wonderful that you want to get vaccinated, but the truth is that we have a supply and demand problem. We don't have enough doses. So right now we have Moderna and Pfizer, they have been um, actually um, approved, but you're going to have a third one, Johnson & Johnson. They just had um, a hearing in front of the FDA. So things would change when that one comes in the market and there are others that are being um, considered as well. So all I can ask you on behalf of my colleagues is to be patient and, and try to get, you know, register, pre-register. And the way it's working is that the state is having six um, basically mass vaccination sites and they and the governor decided now that he will have one centralized um, registration system for those six vaccination sites, which helps, but not really a lot, um, because you have the 24 different jurisdictions that are doing it on their own. So the number for that, if you do not have a computer and you cannot register, um, please call 855-634-6829, 855-634-6829. And you can actually, they'll, if you call it, they have different languages, they're supposed to help you register. And when your, when your um, you know, face comes up, your turn comes up, please consider getting vaccinated because we need to build enough um, immunity in the community you know, for us to overcome this. But we're working on it. And, one, and lastly, one of the um, bills that I'm working on is a bill that I just put in this session that calls for the Maryland Department of Health to work with the local health departments and develop a two-year plans about um, testing, contact tracing, and vaccination to be able to have one plan, right? And allow also the discretion and flexibility for the local health departments um, to change some things as well. 
but one plan that will work for everyone. And we have expectations of how many you know, tests should be given every day. We have expectations of how many vaccines should be given every day. And we're getting a lot of government, a lot of money, over $1 billion from the federal government. So the bill actually requests that that money be given to the locals to be able to implement all these programs because the local health departments are underfunded and we have underfunded public health for decades. So thank you for having me. Please know that we're working on it. Please be patient. And while we're here, we are definitely keeping the pressure on the Department of Health to do it right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Delegate Pena Malnick. It was, I really appreciate all of your advocacy and you making time for us tonight. I know that, um, as, as I said, that you've got uh, con conflicting uh, uh, scheduling challenges. So, so we really appreciate you being able to give us that time. Um, and Dr. Geddon, I'm going to turn to you. Um, I have, I have, uh, I have spent a lot of time on the phone with Dr. Nilesh Kalyanaraman, um, who I know I know is is actually on another forum tonight, on another town hall on this issue. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, and and if you could speak to some of the challenges we've been experiencing in in, in Anne Arundel County, and I think I think to uh, Delegate Pena Melnick's point. We definitely have a supply and demand issue, um, but I know there have been other issues with with um, predictability in terms of um, of knowing what was coming, knowing the doses, so that we could set up those appointments. And have have we seen um, have we have we seen a leveling out of of that predictability? Um, and and where are we? Right. Thank you for having me, um, Delegate Bagno. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity and I'll preface my starting with, I have three small children, so you may hear some squealing in the background. Um, Always happy for children and, and, and animals. <laughs> so as far as predictability, um, we have in the last two weeks um, actually received word from the state of what we will be receiving for at least the next four weeks. Prior to that, it was a week to week um, decision that was being made. And we were told usually just a few days um, before the shipment would arrive, which did make it difficult to plan uh, staffing locations, um, getting invitations out to clinics was all really tied to whether or not we would get more or less vaccine um, for the upcoming week. So we, we have received notice that we'll be receiving 3,400 vaccines um, for the next, now it will be three weeks, um, so that is helpful, but you know, planning out even further than that would be would be great. Um, you're right; we absolutely have a supply and demand issue. Uh, as I mentioned, the 3,400 vaccines and the number of residents that we have that are interested in being vaccinated is a, a definite mismatch. Um, we have a lot of residents who are uh, interested, have pre-registered with the county system. Um, and would like to know when they will be vaccinated. And unfortunately, with that amount of vaccine, we usually can't actually give people within the next X number of weeks, right? We would love to say that, but um, it doesn't really allow for us to, to say that. And in the, here at the health department, we have the capacity to increase the number of vaccines that we're able to distribute um, on a weekly basis pretty tremendously. We just don't have the vaccine to do it. So we hear you, uh, we know that people wanna be vaccinated and we are trying our best to get all of those vaccines out within the week. Um, they come in, we get them out, all 3,400 are moved um, through the health department and with our partnership with the fire department and Chief Wolford's team. So these vaccines are moving and we hope to get more in the future so we can vaccinate more people. Um, but that's been the amount of vaccine has been the biggest challenge um, one of the other significant challenges that I'm sure folks have heard about is the sharing of the vaccine links. Um, in Anne Arundel County, we are still in phase 1B. So that means we are vaccinating anyone in phase 1A or phase 1B. Um, I understand why people share links, right? This is a, um, a limited commodity, um, a life-saving resource, and people want to help their family and friends get vaccinated. But what that typically means is that we, are, we have a lot of folks who are not eligible yet because we have not moved into their phase signing up for vaccine spots. And then we have to do a lot of work to inform people that their appointments um, have been canceled, 
and making sure that we're getting more eligible people. So it, it slows down the process a bit for those uh, phases that we are vaccinating at the moment um, to have that amount of work go into cleaning up some of the link sharing. So those are two of the two of the major challenges we're facing right now. And I think um, you know something that, that we hear a lot from our constituency is not understanding the difference between the sort of supply and demand and this ramping up that we keep hearing about. You know, we keep hearing that the state is ramping up, the county is ramping up. Um, but that's more about creating the framework for when we have additional doses. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, that, that is correct. So in order to have these really large vaccine sites, we have to identify locations. In the health department, we've had to hire, um, it'll probably be upwards of 120 people when this is, when we're finished hiring to do this, um, as well as, uh, so locations, people, and then you know, there are things that you need to run a site, but that takes time to get those to get those things up and running. We spent the better part of December and January kind of ramping up. Um, we are there at this point. We have more than enough locations. We really need more vaccine to be able to run those locations um, for multiple days of the week. This week, we are um, moving into a South County location at Lula Scott. Uh, for one day of the week and into the O'Malley Annex, which is a, um, across from the O'Malley Senior Center in Odenton. So trying to geographically spread out, but we are simply spreading the same amount of vaccine, um, trying to make it more convenient for those who live in areas that have not had as much access to our vaccine clinics. But if we had more vaccine, we could run those clinics multiple days a week um, to bring a lot more access across the county. And um. And, and are you hearing the same sort of time time frame that that we're hearing that 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 the ramp up from federal access to the vaccine is going to be sort of mid mid April um, when we'll actually start seeing seeing the numbers increasing or 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 has that timeline shifted as well? Um, that's about what we're hearing, but we haven't gotten any solids on. You know, it'll be second or third week of April. It's Hopefully in April we'll see a shift, but we haven't um, we haven't heard anything new. But we also don't have a definitive answer on when that increase will happen. Thank you so much. I want I wanted to um to take a moment and 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 uh, talk to Miss Jordan. Um, Miss Jordan, we've 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 talked. What you've had you've had many hats throughout throughout uh, the the COVID crisis. Um, and I know that you were um, coordinating early on with um, with our response with the nursing homes. Is that correct? That's, that is correct. And yes, there have been many hats. Um, a lot of it was resources under the CARES Act funding, making sure that our nursing homes were uh, receiving the um, testing they needed and the um, isolation and quarantine to keep all the nursing home residents safe. So yes. And, um, and it seems like... <laughs> it seems like we we have um, in Anne Arundel County we've we've done a, a a very good job of sort of managing that community because I know that early on that was that was where our fear was that with with spread we really got resources into those communities we got protocols into the communities um, we had a very robust uh, testing protocol a very robust uh, contact tracing protocol um, the, I believe we had the first contact tracing mm -hmm. program in the state uh, countywide and and actually the, the for those who don't that the, the state contact tracing program was actually modeled after Anne Arundel County. Um, so, so we've been able to manage our numbers, although we haven't been able to, um, you know, to alleviate them because obviously we're in a pandemic. Um, but how has, how has your role shifted as, as the pandemic has, has uh, progressed? So um, great question. And if I can, I just, I want, just want to thank you for having me. I do bring greetings from County Executive Stuart Pittman. And we certainly, um, I thank you for your work on the Health and Government Committee, along with the uh, uh, Delegate Pinion Melnick and um, for the Relief Act. So thank you. And um, I know that uh, Congressman Brown is represented and thank you for all fighting for all the federal aid for this county. It's Adam, thank you if you'll pass that along. Um, so the role has now shifted because of the, um, the phase we're in for vaccinations is with our older adults. So our, um, and if I can back up to the nursing homes and assisted livings for a minute, 
Anne Arundel County is very lucky that the staff at the Department of Aging and Disabilities enjoys a fabulous, strong relationship with all of the nursing homes and assisted living providers in the county. Um, so it was an easy, I wouldn't say easy, it was a natural lift. Let's just say it was a natural lift for staff to build those relationships with the nursing homes, assisted livings, the Department of Health, and then the state resources to make sure that everybody was safe. But now our role is helping people age 75 plus um, make sure that they get pre-registered and that they're getting their vaccinations. And to do that, we have set up a, a very efficient system by calling, it was our former food um, and COVID resource line, and you can still get lots of resources off 410222 food. But if you're an older adult and the technology is gonna be challenging, um, I encourage people, and I'll put it in the chat, um, they can call that phone number and um, they'll be greeted by a live call taker who will help them pre-register. And if they get, when they get their notice to um, schedule their appointment, they can call back and we'll help them schedule. So um, we're trying to provide all the technical support we can in cooperation with Department of Health and, and really proud that there's people from all over county government who have pitched in to uh, manage these phone calls and help people register, pre-register. That's, that's a really extraordinary sort of recycling of that resource too. And, and I think something that, that we've talked about um, and I've talked with the, the, the county executive, I've talked with um, uh, our health officer, um, Dr. Kalyana Raman, is about sort of the lessons learned that, that we'll be able to utilize sort of post COVID. Um, and looking looking at at that larger landscape. So, do you feel like there are are, um, are resources that we've developed? I, I, one of one of the the the, um, the the resources the county executive talked about was was um, was the the food resiliency program that um, worked with Feed Anne Arundel that it also brought resiliency to the restaurant industry and our hospitality industry that was really suffering. It was like this incredible synergy um, that, that has really given us sort of a platform for delivering those services uh, when, we're, when we're not in a pandemic. That's probably one of the best examples you could possibly give is <laughs> have worked really hard to lift up the restaurant industry by feeding the most, um, most vulnerable in the community too. So Lots of um, intergenerational programs going on now with restaurants and feeding older adults who used to depend on the senior centers, which remain closed um, uh, under the governor's orders and for good reason. Um, and that's where people used to depend on a hot meal um, at least five days a week. So the restaurants, we've learned a lot from those partnerships. Um, we have developed partnerships within county agencies that we didn't even um couldn't have considered before the um, pandemic, but um, another example is how we are doing the $500 gift cards for anybody that's impact, been impacted by any of the county executives' executive orders um, that uh, started in November when we really had to start pulling back again because the numbers were just escalating. So um, we have our workforce development office who has never done such a project before, and now they have made great contacts. They're going out to businesses to distribute these cards and helping people with job skills at the same time. So we have learned a lot. Um, and, and if I could, um, I'm, I'm sure you might have other questions. I just want to touch on the equity piece. Absolutely. Um, very, very important to our county executive, our health officer, all the county government is committed to that. And we know that there's a challenge with um, reaching um, our black and brown residents and making sure that they have enough access to the vaccination. What we've heard from some, from some different listening sessions is we have to build trust. And one way we're going to do that is to try to be in the community. And I know um, Dr. Geddon, Dr. Kalyana Raman, they're looking at ways to start working with our faith leaders in the community so that we can come to them and do some education and demonstrate the safety of the vaccination. And our faith leaders are on board and committed to getting the vaccination and spreading the word within their, um, their congregations. Um, so lots of work we're doing with United Black Clergy, the Immigrant Affairs Commission, great program in Annapolis. You, I know you must know about it, Take Care Annapolis with Laura Gutierrez. Mm -hmm. um, and just trying to build trust with our um, minority populations and to, um, make sure that they are getting equitable access to, while limited, the vaccines that are out there. And I, re I really appreciate you uh, speaking to that because I, 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 I'm part of that, that um, equity 
task force for Anne Arundel County. Um, so, so I have I have appreciated being able to see the work um, that that is uh, that that's being done. Those conversations that are being had. And, um, and just yesterday, we had a um, we had a, a a program on on how we were looking at at uh, those equity issues within within the vaccination rollout. Um, and speaking of the vaccination rollout, I do want to, to, to take a moment and, um, and speak with our, our chief, Tricia Wolford, because you were, um, your whole team was on the front lines from, from the beginning of the vaccine rollout, um, getting, getting vaccines into arms for, for our, our first responders and our uh, essential employees. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So obviously with the help of the health department, um, Tony and her team, um, a, a huge partner. Uh, but yeah, this was um, obviously the 1A group was public safety. And um, we thought what what better way to, to do that than to have our own public safety folks help promote that. Again, um, you know, we're, we're grateful that people want to get the vaccine. Uh, and at the same time, there's always a good reason to increase the messaging, to increase the numbers of more getting the vaccine. And uh, so we partnered with the health department um, my firefighters are all um, EMS trained. Uh, every firefighter either is a EMTB or a paramedic. And it's interesting because we always think of our role in emergent situations. Um, and anytime we're, we're in the medical field and providing uh, care and medicine, it's in an emergent situation. And this opportunity, I mean, what an honor, obviously, to be trusted with such a valuable resource. And then at the same time for us to do non-emergent medicine and engage with the community at that level, um, we've never had that opportunity. It's, it's very difficult to do. Um, we have experience with vaccination um, or I'm sorry, with um, you know flu vaccine, things like that. And, and we've done that uh, for our fire department and our law enforcement agencies. So this was really an extension of that, obviously very different, but similar skill set. Um, and we learned a lot. So we conducted uh, multiple clinics. We invited every public safety agency in the county. Um, we invited um, agents and agencies that are working within the county. If you were supporting Anne Arundel County residents um, in fire, EMS, law enforcement, you were invited to the clinic. And uh, we ended up doing just under 2,500 and um, a very efficient process. If there's one thing that fire departments do well, I mean, I would say we do a lot of things well, but logistics um, and having a, a, a set system. Um, Chief Lisa Mayers is in charge of her training academy and that's where we ran it out of. And it was, we just got some of the nicest compliments. Um, one of the great things about it is um, there was energy in the room. It That feeling of hope and um, gratefulness, because uh, we're very lucky. We, we know the job that we signed up to do. Um, we never try and ask for anything in return, but we were so grateful, we being law enforcement and fire and EMS, um, that we were, had the opportunity to receive the vaccine in such an early state. So um, it really had a, a great feel to it. And, and, and that's a really important point too, because I think sometimes we, we forget um, they, they, the emotional impact of, of COVID on our first responders. I mean, you and I have talked about that mm -hmm. um, in just the, 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 not just physical, but the emotional drain of, of, this, of this crisis and, and having that, that hope and actually being on, you know, on the front end of, of providing that hope um, was, was, was very emotional, you said, for, for your team. It was. And, you know, it, it happened in a lot of industries. You didn't just have to be the first responder, but obviously with our fire department, um, you know, 75, 80 percent of our call volume being EMS calls and going to hospitals. Um, and there is no working from home. There are many other industries that had that same feeling of in order to do your job, you had to leave your house um, and the stress that that creates um, of what you, you know, what you engage with and what goes home to your family. Um, and we're a very family oriented department, you know, we're, we're communal on the fact that it's a 24 hour shift. And um, so you have two homes to deal with, you know, you have the, the home that they go home to, and then you have their home work environment. And um, so there, there is a, a, a mental health aspect that, and we see it everywhere in the community. 
Um, so when we got the opportunity to, to be able to work with the health department and to be able to vaccinate, um, I can't think of anything more important that we should be doing. And, you know, we're getting that opportunity again to work in the community and, and with a different group. Um, it's, I, I just feel this tremendous sense of pride. Um, I just feel extremely honored that we would be trusted with it and that our team executes so well. I think we're we're very lucky in Anne Arundel County to have you and and such an extraordinary EMS team and 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 our the the, the synergy between our law enforcement our uh, firefighters and and our behavioral health services. I mean we're we're extraordinarily lucky in Anne Arundel County, um, and and I will say that you know the county executive speaks so very highly of of you and your team and and um, Dr. Kalyana Raman that they said that you were going to be working with um with our educating our, our our educators as well in um in the vaccine rollout uh as we're as we're looking at um reopening the the school buildings and getting getting hybrid learning into into the buildings yes that so that's where we currently are um again just partnering with the health department everybody has their hands full i mean speaking with pam and tony and the 75 and older group um, working through 1A and still and, and people in that group that are that are trying to get their appointments set. Um, it was one of those things that, you know, talking with the county executive and, you know, where can we continue to make an impact? What, what can we do in the community? Um, and for me, I just felt like what, what a natural uh, partnership of, you know, educators and firefighters. You know, you can't, um, in a public safety sense and in a public education sense, um, we have no better partner than to be with our teachers. Um, and I think there's probably no more significant impact that we could make for families and children. And um, so I thought that was a great group to be working with. It's a very big group um, and we're trying to get through them just as fast as we can. Like Tony says, there's, there's only so much vaccine and um, they're being very patient. So we're running weekly clinics out of um, Suburban Park High School. Um, Vicki Plitt and her team over there are tremendous. They have people volunteering. We're running probably eight to 10 hours a day. We do it all in one day, um, a minimum of a thousand. And, um, and we're just like everybody else waiting our turn and, and signing up. But uh, again, it's been a, a seamless process. It takes quite a workforce um, that, that is a very busy workforce on both sides of the house. But um, we expect us to probably go, you know, another 10 more weeks or, um, maybe we'll get lucky and, you know, with other approvals of vaccine that there'll, there'll be a plethora coming in and we can get that done sooner. Um, but we, we love working with the educators and staff. We think it's a great partnership and just really hoping that we can go faster instead of slower. We're, we're very excited to just be able to help everybody feel comfortable going back to school, whether it's the children, the parents or the educator. Everybody just wants to be comfortable. Thank you so much. And, and, and again, I, I, I want to sort of go back to what uh, Dr. Geddon said, what uh, Delegate Pena Melnick said, is that we're still coming up against this um, supply and demand issue, because as I understand it, that um, uh, your your team is 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 ready to to again ramp up if if we have the doses, and it sounds like there is some hope on the horizon with with a with a third vaccine, um, but but you're not at max capacity at this point. Is that correct? in terms of vaccinations, uh, in terms of your ability to, to provide vaccinations? And you're asking Dr. Gadden, right? <laughs> yes, Dr. Gadden, sorry. Yes, no, okay. we, we, are, we are not at maximum capacity. Uh, we built in the ability to deliver many more vaccines uh, when we were first designing our clinics and our staffing models. Um, so we could really almost triple what we're doing right now. Um, if we had the vaccine to do it, there's, we've got, we've got staff, we've got wonderful partners with Anne Arundel County Community College and Maryland Live, that, and we're delivering vaccines at both of those locations. We have a drive-through location in Glen Burnie um, and the other two locations that I mentioned in, at Lula Scott and the O'Malley Annex. Um, so we have locations, we need vaccine, but we are not. And I think and I think that's the challenge that we keep coming up against because, um, you know, I, I think there was even a, a hope tonight that there would, you know, there would, there would be like Delegate Bagnall's 
secret way to, to, you know, to, to get a vaccine. And there, there, there is no, like, there's no, there's no magic, you know, there, there's, no, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no, um, secret, uh, map to, to, to getting vaccinated. Um, we did have a question in the chat, um, about, uh, whether uh, Anne Arundel County was able to make the decision on their own about getting teachers vaccinated, or if that was, um, I, I assume it, that was something that came from the State Department of Ed, or if Anne Arundel County was able to to make those those decisions independently on how to how to um, address the, the the rollout for for uh, vaccinating our educators. Um, yeah, we were the state definitely informed us when we moved to one B that educators were a priority. The way that each county gets that done is up to the individual county. So for us, the partnership, as Chief Wolford said, with the fire department and um, public school system was fantastic. And then for educators in non-public schools, the health department is still uh, inviting and making sure that those folks are also prioritized to come through all of the clinics that I mentioned at our various locations in the county. And I'll just add to say with that, we, we were in the appropriate tier um, at the time the decision was made. And um, when the county executive and I spoke, um, you know, we basically said, what can you handle? Well, this is the priority going on. And this is a very large group, uh, about 14,000. Um, and I just thought, what better way? We know we're efficient. We got a, a good uh, practice run, if you will, with public safety, and um, we knew we could handle the volume. We also knew that the health department was going to have their hands full um, getting through the next tiers and um, the 75 and older, and that's a very large group in our county. Um, so we just felt like between the county executive and I having a conversation, uh, again, where can you make a big impact? Um, and not that any group is more important than another, because that's, that's always part of the story. Um, but it was you know, it, it was for me a great partnership that I really didn't want to pass up on. Um, so kudos to the county executive for, um, you know, letting me do that and, and trusting me with that. But that's how that decision was made. Thank you so much. Um, and, and Dr. Geddon, um, can, can I ask you to clarify? Because again, I think there's a lot of confusion and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to, to get the right information out. We now have the GOVAC site, but the GOVAC site still identifies locations within your county, but you still have to make individual appointments um, and that the county restrictions are, are not, um, or the, 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 the county phases are not the same across the board. But then you add into the mix uh, CVS, Giant, um, and these mass vac sites, which are or are not county specific. Um, and I think there's just a lot of confusion about what to do, where to go, and also what you're going to hear because um, the response from setting up an appointment, say in Anne Arundel County, is that you get a response when there's appointment open, if I'm correct. Um, the response from some of the mass vac sites is either you don't get through or, or you're, you're in the waiting list. Um, so again, I think there's, there's confusion. So can you just speak to what that looks like in Anne Arundel County through the health department, um, and, and how that is different from some of these other sites? Sure. Absolutely. So I think what people are running into most places, um, that you mentioned is some sort of either pre-registration or interest form or wait list. Um, everybody calls it something a little bit different, which I think also leads to a bit of the confusion. Um, it's but very confusing. <laughs> ultimately, what everyone is trying to do is to get your name and an understanding of who you are, maybe what you do for a living and your age into their system. So when it is your turn, you can be contacted. So in Anne Arundel County, we have a pre-registration website um, and you can go on that website, tell us again, your name, your date of birth, um, if you live or work in the county, uh, and what your occupation is. So if we are in your phase at the moment, so for instance, we are still um, making our way through some healthcare workers, uh, we will, when appointments are available, and that's typically happening once a week, thank you, Pam, she just put it in the, the chat, it's aacounty.org uh, backslash COVID vax. Um, what we will do, if your name is in that system, 
when appointments become available, we will email you an invitation to a clinic. Um, and what's happening is we do that through random selection. So it's, we get questions from people, well, I signed up weeks ago and I haven't heard yet. Um, in order to make the process equitable, we, the computer does a randomized selection of the number um, of appointments we have available and we'll pull names out and then we'll invite those individuals to our clinics. So that's how you can get um, invited to a clinic in Anne Arundel County and hopefully then scheduled for a vaccine thereafter. Uh, once you get that invitation, you have to click on a link uh, that will come through your email to sign up in the state system. It's called PrepMod. Um, which is where you actually put in your information. It's kind of like your health record um, where you'll get your, your, once you've been vaccinated, you'll get your vaccine record through there. And that's where we document exactly which vaccine you received and that type of information during the clinics themselves. But that's the process for any of the county locations um, at this moment. And, um, and when you set up that initial appointment, does it automatically trigger the, the, the second dose appointment as well? So it does not automatically trigger that. What happens when you come to the clinic, you get a vaccine card and we'll put down the date that you need to come back. And then within two to three days of you uh, having your first dose appointment, you'll get a second email from us inviting you to register for that clinic. If that date doesn't work for you, you can absolutely call us and we'll work with you. Um, but for the most part, we try to keep it to the 21 or 28 day um, mark. Uh, but there is absolutely wiggle room. The CDC has approved, you know, up to six weeks around that. Um, you know, we've had to explain that a lot with weather cancellations and delays that is OK if it's not exactly on that 21st or 28th day. But we do send you a, a follow up link to schedule. And if you have trouble registering, if you don't have a computer or Internet access, uh, we do have some availability on site to help people schedule their second dose appointments. And I think we're doing a lot of that with our seniors right now, as much as we can. Um, again, with a little more staffing, we could probably do a little more on site second dose uh, appointments. Thank you so much. And, um, and Ms. Jordan, there's been a whole um, education arm to this from the county, um, not just in terms of reaching our uh, most uh, challenged populations with the digital divide, but just even even as Dr. Gen said, you know the CDC um, uh, the CDC recommendations have changed. I think a lot of people were were trying to make sure that they were they were adhering to that timeline, and they were very nervous, um, not knowing that that the information is changing. So, um, what kind of mechanisms do we have in the county to sort of keep people the most up to date? And how can we partner at the state level to make sure that we're getting out the most accurate information? I, I will say um, that that I get um, I get a lot of press releases from the county, particularly from the health department, and I always share them out on my social media. For anyone who who doesn't know, um, you can go to my Facebook page and uh, and I will share it out from the county. But I know that the county has also taken on a big educational arm. So what does that look like, and how is that altered as we've as we've uh, gone on? So um, the Department of Health, great questions, has a, um, a health equity initiative. And while that, um, and Dr. Geddon can correct me if I'm wrong, and it may have started with some different goals pre-COVID, it certainly is looking at how to vaccinate um, our community with an equity lens. One of the biggest things that we do is just like what we're doing tonight, we have um, a lot of FaceTime through Zoom with our community. But for people that don't have the technology, and I think that was part of your question, is um, it's 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 door to door in some cases. Um, I know we're, we're we have people doing that in Annapolis. We are um, holding town halls. Um, uh, again, you do have to have access to technology, um, but we're taking every opportunity to try to connect with people. One of the things that I think has worked really well is every um, Friday, Department of Aging and Disabilities does a food distribution, and it's been a great resource. Well, we do it three times a week, but we have fresh food Fridays, but it's been a great resource to just put a uh, postcard in everybody's box of fruits and vegetables. And um, it's very simple. We put the um, the uh, way to pre-register on that and where to call for assistance. And um, while people may not have phones, uh, may not have computers or be internet savvy, um, 
these vaccinations really are just a phone call away as um, and people can, if they can just call either the Department of Health phone number, which I'll put in there, or for the older adults calling the 222 food, really we're just a phone call away. And I hope that people are not intimidated by the process of trying to schedule online because there's people ready to help. Well, and, and I think that's an important point too. And, I, and I'll share that information out. Um, sort of going in a different direction, one of the things that we've discovered um, during COVID is the, 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 the use of telehealth and particularly audio only telehealth. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like this is another, this is another aspect of that where people who are not necessarily technologically savvy or, or they, or they simply have, um, you know, barriers like, like, you know, low um, access to Wi-Fi have been utilizing that, that audio only um, service. And it sounds like that's something that the county does offer walking you through this process. That's true. And, you know, you just uh, it reminded me that we have an internet essentials program that the Partnership for Children, Youth and Family um, can help uh, people get internet essentials for their telemed, for their telehealth appointments, for students, for people doing job searches. So um, if you, again, if you call the, the 3663, we can hook you up with um, internet essentials for families that don't have internet connectivity. Um, you know, and if there's any one message, just to wrap up your question, please get people to pre-register. I think that's the biggest message. Encourage people to pre-register, their turn will come up. And um, uh, once they pre-register, they get a confirmation email and they stay on that list until they get their invitation. So while it may take some time, as Dr. Geddon said, they will get their invitation to, um, to receive the vaccine. And in the meantime, as you started, I believe you started the meeting with practice social distancing, continue to wash hands, and mask up. And even after the vaccine, is my understanding, mm -hmm. even after the vaccine, because uh, we want to we want to make sure we're not just keeping ourselves safe, but we're keeping our community safe. And and um, and we don't we don't know where people are in that process. And, and I know the information is always changing. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Um, I want to make sure that we're giving people an opportunity to ask questions if they have them. Um, Again, we you know we we don't have a we don't have a secret formula for how to um, how to access the vaccine, but I think I think to um, to your point, Miss Jordan, um, once you're in that waiting list, it's it's, it's kind of like being in the waiting the Zoom waiting room. We know you're there. We haven't forgotten you, and and we will we will get to you. Um, but as as Dr. Geddon said, it is a randomized system, um, and we're still coming up against that. Uh, that supply and demand issue, which hopefully we will we will see some some progress um, as as uh, as we ramp up at the federal level, so that 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 makes it down to the state. Um, my question for for all of our panelists would be: um, What can we do at the state level? How how can we support the efforts that that you are making in Anne Arundel County? Um, and how and how can we lobby for what you need? That's a that's a great question. Um, I think some of the things that we that we need um, education. As you when you ask that question, we're trying to get as much of that out there as we can. But there are still a number of people who don't really understand these the numerous systems that exist. Um, you know, any sort of coordination is always helpful. But educating people in the process, uh, and then you know, fact. Um, making sure that people have factual information about the vaccines themselves, which is another thing that the health department is really trying to work to do. And I think on a state level, you know, PSAs, we get a lot of myths that are being kind of spread about that we have to um, make sure that we're addressing and trying to, to give people the right information. Um, and then, you know, I think other things that we could really use, obviously more vaccines. So I'll make sure I throw that one in there. Um, is one of the one of the things that that everyone um, could use. So education, more vaccine, um, any sort of uh, state level coordination efforts or increased coordination is always um, is always welcome. So, you know, confusion for residents um, is something that we're up against on a pretty regular basis. So anything that helps people better understand um, where we are, and um, yeah, I think those are the big three that I can think of. And no link sharing. 
it seems like a good idea. Oh, yes. No, on, no on the should. back end, it's it's a nightmare for us. And it puts both sides in a very, very compromising kind of position when we have to turn people away at the clinic because they're not of age. They have somebody shared a link. It's health department staff is working hard enough already. It, they don't need to be in a confrontational situation with people when it's not their turn, but they signed up from a link that they got from a neighbor or a friend. And um, it's, you know, just be patient and wait your turn. We will get to you. And I would probably add, um, that I think there's nothing stronger than good partnerships. Um, the understanding that anybody working okay. towards these efforts is, we all have the same mission. You know, uh, my, uh, my world is always very mission focused, um, but if everybody stays focused on the goal is more arms and more needles. And when those things come together, that is what we're working to do. Um, I will not be shy and, and say um, there's always funding. Um, there's no part of everything we're doing that isn't because we want to and because we are honored to do it. But at the end of the day, there has to be money too. You know, that, that is the, the, the not fancy part of it um, that, you know, it requires it. It's staffing, it's logistics. It's um, you know, when all those things come together, this is hundreds and thousands of hours um, and people love doing the work, but, but we all know that, you know, everybody wants to have a paycheck and um, they want to be valued monetarily for the work that they do. It doesn't take away from the compassion and the empathy in their heart, um, but it all takes money. No, I, I, I asked you to, to, to tell me the truth. Yeah, I <laughs> so won't be I, shy, I, money. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Um, we did have a question in the chat and I think it's a great question. I think it's one that, that um, and it's one that I can't answer. Um, but, but the question is, is there now greater transparency about how vaccines have been diverted from the county to the private pharmacies? Do we have confidence that the doses are generally staying within the county? Um, and I think it's a great question. It's a question that I've, I've talked to Dr. Kalyanaraman uh, about previously, um, and, and we didn't yet have a good answer. Um, Dr. Geddon, do we have more transparency or are we still, are we still struggling with that? Um, and, and do we need to, to lobby harder at the state level with, with our, our state Department of Health? Yeah, we, we are still struggling with that. We, we don't know um, the amounts of vaccines that are being given to the pharmacies in the county. We know the pharmacies and, um, or the amounts, you know, for instance, we know how many we're getting for the next four weeks, but we don't have that answer for the pharmacies or for the vaccines that are going to the mass vac sites. So that also makes it a little difficult for us to determine how many of our residents and where to tell them to go, right? If you have a re relatively small amount of vaccine at your local pharmacy, do you encourage people to sign up there? Do you, you know, it, it really helps in planning and to understand the amount of vaccine in the county in totality um, to, to understand where our focus as a health department should be. Um, and we've definitely been moving further towards the equity side as we've had less vaccination because while some of those uh, organizations are trying to, to take an equity lens, um, they're also you know, a little bit more first come, first serve, and not really uh, specifically focused on our vulnerable populations and trying to get those individuals vaccinated uh, first or specific outreach to them. So we are still um, struggling with what is the amount of vaccine in the county uh, in its totality. Thank you so much. And, and I think um, to, to Ms. Jordan's point too, that's some of the complication with the, with the link sharing is I don't, I don't know that everyone realizes how damaging that is when we have these very different um, modalities for each site. Um, when you're talking about mass vaccination sites that aren't county specific, um, but, but still you're, you're not sure if, if you're going to a site in Prince George's County, are you in the phase of Prince George's County or are you still in the phase of, of your residence? Um, so, so to, to Mr. Dupee, we will continue to work on that issue. I know it's something that, that, that we're working on in our, in our, uh, committee. It's also something that the, uh, Senate is working on. There's, and there's, there's also a vaccine, uh, equity work group um, 
that are that are all trying to get clarity on that because because it is it is a very real concern. Um, it's hard for any of us to do our jobs efficiently if we don't know if we don't have the big picture. And I, I don't think that's I don't think that's an overstatement um, for me to 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 say on behalf of everyone on this panel um, that it's it's really tough to to do our job when we don't have the the bigger picture of of where we fit in. Um, and I don't see any other questions. If if something if something comes to you after after we're off this call and. Um, we will make sure to, to get that information out to you. Please, please feel free to just email me. Um, and you can send me an email. Um, please do uh, follow, follow us on social media. I do get the information out as I get it from the county and they are very, very good about uh, getting information into our hands. I wanna thank all of our panelists again tonight, Dr. Geddon, Ms. Jordan, Chief Wolford, and also um, Adam Spangler, who was here on behalf of Congressman Brown's office. I wanna thank everyone who was on this call tonight, um, everyone who's watching on the live stream. Um, I do also wanna say that, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of this call, this is the second in a series. Uh, next week, we will be, um, we will we will be uh, working on uh, the the impacts of of client of the climate crisis, and so um, so it will be sending out the information about that. Once again, thank you all so much. Um, I am honored to serve this county. I'm honored to to work with all of you, and I really appreciate you being here tonight to to walk us through this very very complicated landscape.